John chapter 13, beginning in verse 31. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all know, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let's pray together. Lord, we're so grateful for this passage. We're so grateful for John the Apostle to be led by you to reveal it to us, or else we wouldn't know it any other way. And so we're thankful for that. We, we know, Lord, that as we yield our hearts to you this morning and for you to say to us anything you want to say to us, Lord, we want to have hearts that are ready to receive your word. So help us to be open and vulnerable and, and, and just have our hearts pliable for you to speak to, Lord. We want to be doers of the word, not hearers only. So help us to listen for what we are obeying or not obeying instead of merely for information as great as that is. So we pray that you would set this time aside. We commit it to you, Lord, and we pray that you would use it for your purposes. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we are still in the upper room as we go through this passage, and Judas has just departed. We saw the last couple times we've been in this book uh, that Jesus purged him out from among them so he could do the thing that he had already planned in his heart to do. He could go to the chief priest. He could basically, he knew that most likely that night they would end up in the Garden of Gethsemane and he could bring them there um, to arrest him and everything. So the remaining disciples, as we saw last time, had no idea why he left. When Jesus said, what you do, do quickly, they thought it might have been something that he needed to purchase for the Passover or for the feast of Passover uh, or some benevolence that he commanded Judas to go out and, and do um, do something to, to bless the poor. They had no idea that Judas was the one. That just shows how hard it is sometimes to discern if someone has bad motives or a bad heart or is not a believer. We, we it just we can't know that. And we talked about the wheat and the tares that Jesus talked about and how at the end of time he's going to, at the age he's going to gather the wheat and separate the wheat from the chaff or the tares there. And uh, he knows the hearts. We don't. We make a lousy judge (laughs) of of people's hearts. We don't know people's hearts, but he does. Uh, So we saw that after he gave Judas the bread, that Satan possessed him. Uh, and, And Jesus said to him right before that, what you do, do quickly. Satan possessed him, and then he took off. So he said, do quickly what you're going to do because there was a timing to everything. There was an exact timing, and apparently Judas wasn't on that time frame in terms of the timing of his betrayal. And Jesus got him back on his timetable because there was an exact timetable. Everything, there's so many free will decisions that were made in that whole process that God sovereignly oversaw. And so all this timing had to be maintained. So um, so he's in the middle of, do, of talking to his disciples. As I've said, this whole section from here all the way through the end of chapter 17, Jesus is preparing the disciples for his departure. He's so gracious. He thinks of everything, doesn't he? he he's so good. He, he, there's nothing he leaves out. He's so good at, at what he does. And so um, he has them in his sights. They have themselves in their sights. They're, the, they're fighting about who's the greatest and who's going to get status. They have status in their sights. But he has them in their sights. It would have been a blessing for them to be about him and about God in the, in the, in the, during this time. It would be a blessing to him. But Jesus doesn't wait for that to happen. He doesn't respond with love. Just be, I mean, he doesn't do things because we're so deserving of things of, at all which we'll, he'll get in, we'll get into later, but he does them because they're the right thing to do and because he is love. Now, he, Jesus doesn't have to deal with unbelief anymore, except 
you know, during this little window, when, once he gets arrested, he's going to be dealing with lots of unbelief from the Romans, from Caiaphas to Annas to Pilate. Uh, to the, and also the worst thing I'm sure that hurt his heart the most is hearing the crowd say, crucify him, crucify him, let the blood of him be on our heads. And, and so that, that I know just was so hurtful to him. It's like we, we have to forget he didn't remove his feelings and make himself immune to having hurt feelings. He was devastated by this, I'm sure. So no other gospel reveals this section of Scripture. No other gospel writer. Only John reveals this. So in a sense, it's holy ground for us. Uh, It's just so amazing what he does, what he says. We're going to be going through so many things as we go through these chapters. So much amazing teaching. And he's, he's, he got Judas out of the equation, and now he's going to be totally focusing on saying things to disciples because Judas was never a disciple. He was never a, a believer in that sense at all. He was never a Christian. And what he's going to be telling them is very relevant to believers. That's why as we go through it, we're going to be impacted so much like we are as we go through his scripture in any place in the, in the word. So he, he's going to enjoy that more than we're going to enjoy it as we go through all these deep, deep teachings. And he's going to talk about the promised Holy Spirit and talking about, you know, you know him coming and gathering them, them to himself and come and get them, and he prepares a place for them. That's our next chapter that we're going to be looking at. So he's going to focus on saying something to them that's really important. These are basically, these chapters are like the last words to the disciples. And when someone is getting ready to die, and as a pastor, I've been in rooms, many rooms where that's happening, and I see the interaction. I'm just sitting being quiet, but I see the interaction between the person and their loved ones. And they oftentimes don't have the strength to say a bunch of words. They just have the strength to say a few words. So they are saying the most important things to their family, the things that they want to leave with their family that their family will never forget. So last words are important. And what does he choose? What does he start out from this whole section of him preparing his disciples and teaching them and encouraging them and, and, and fortifying their hearts against despair and deception and all these things? What does he start with? He says, love one another. So I've entitled this message this morning, The Importance of Loving One Another. All of the subject matter Jesus could have began, he starts with love. And I just, that just can't be lost on us. We have to see that and see that it's important why he brought this up when he brought it up. Because he knows that he's going to be gone. He's going to tell them in a few verses that they can't follow where he's going to go. And they're not going to have his physical is his the love that he has been showing the last few years with them in person you know and so he's going to do it through his holy spirit of course but he wants them to be loving one another so we are called to love god with all of our heart mind soul and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves so and all of that is critically important for us to, to be a disciple of his, we have to be able to love well. If we excel in anything in life as disciples, it should be loving, loving well. We should be professionals at loving. Why? Because God doesn't depend upon us to produce that love. He gives us his Holy Spirit and gives us the capacity to love well. And that's what he's called each of us to do. It's everything. It's how we grow in our relationship with God because we love him because he first loved us. John told us that. So it's why we do anything for God, or at least it's supposed to be. And God is measuring all of this as we go through our lives and as we're stewards of his time, of his finances, of his gifts that he gives us. It's all his. We've been bought with a price. And so he gets to determine whether or not we lived our lives as good stewards of what everything that he's given to us. There is a judgment day that only Christians will be at. It's not the great white throne judgment. Only unbelievers will be there. And they'll receive a special resurrected body in order to, because they're in Hades right now. They'll be given a special body. They'll be resurrected for the great white throne judgment. And the book of life will be open and other books. And all whose names were not found written in the Lamb's book of life were cast in the lake of fire. So we won't be at, be at that. We will be at the, what's called the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat. The Bema seat was in Corinth, and it was like at the center of town and where a lot of 
things were determined. A lot of civil decisions and judgments were meted out, and also awards were meted out. And so that's the imagery that, that Paul, when he speaks of the Bema Seat, is drawing upon. And every single person that would be reading his letter would know exactly what he's talking about. I want to read the couple passages that he wrote related to the judgment seat of Christ. First of all, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we're told this, For we must all appear before this judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, this wasn't the first time. Um, because, well, you know, there's three Corinthian, three letters to Corinth. I don't know if you know that. First Corinthians is really Second Corinthians, and and Second Corinthians is really Third Corinthians, because we don't have we don't have access to that first letter that Paul refers to that he's already written to them. So he's already said in Second Corinthians. I mean, he's already said in First Corinthians. We just, um, or excuse me, I'm not, not speaking well. I have points poinsettias on my on my mind or something. I don't know. I'm thinking of eggnog. You like eggnog? Wow, that was better than any amens that I've ever heard out of here. You like eggnog? No, no hesitation, not wondering should I speak up. Well, I'm, I have to decide if I really like it. Well, it depends on what I'm eating or drinking it with. None of that was happening. It was just no. That Like eggnog? That, that, yeah, the mic picked that one up for sure. Okay, how did I get on that? I don't know. I want to read the other passage about the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. Clear to whom? Clear to us. And, and, and our God already knows it, but it'll be to us. We are going to see that. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will in, re- receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Each of us will have to give an account for our lives and ministries to Jesus himself. We will not be with anybody else. It'll just be us and him He's going to, we have to give an account for everything that we did, every decision we made, every, every you know, what our motives were. Um, did the Spirit lead us to do what we did? Did we do it to be seen, to get glory from man, which he doesn't share with anybody, he says in his word? And we do it for our own, or did we do it for our own glory? Um, and did we do it in love? Again, that touches on what we're looking at today. Did we do it in love? How many of us have done something great for somebody and we didn't do it in love? Anybody here? Am I the only one? Okay, there's a, for those that are listening or on, watching online, there's, there's a good amount of hands. All of us, we can have all different motives. Sometimes we don't even know our own heart. We don't even know why we're doing what we're doing. And God later whispers to us in your heart, like, you did that for you. You didn't do it for me and you didn't do it for them. And that's, that's, that's the key to loving well. But we will have to give an account if we did the thing, the wrong things at the wrong time or without love as a motive or we weren't led by the Spirit. We'll have to explain what the deal was in that situation. And I'm pretty sure that um, we're not going to have a good answer for that. And so I'm not sure why the teachers and pastors, they talk about the judgment seat of Christ and they talk about it's only a joyful thing, it's a celebration, it's like... The end of Star Wars, the first one, you know, where they're at the award ceremony, you know, and they're all walking up on stage, and it's just all this, all the applause, and they think, that's not what verse 15 that I just read is sharing. I'll read it again. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. That doesn't sound like, uh, uh, you know, this award ceremony, and it's only joyous. I think we will be grieved when we stand before him. For the things that we did, we that we didn't that didn't pass the test, whether it's love or spirit directed or uh, any of those things, it's a very heavy heavy scripture, and so God wants an account for what we did in the body, whether good or bad. Now, this isn't talking about salvation; it's not about heaven and hell. That's already settled because He says in that verse, He Himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Like if you escape a burning house. It's on fire. You bear, you know, you're smelling like smoke. Like you're barely getting out by the skin of your teeth. 
And, and so it's not a thing of where we should be afraid, but it should be should produce sobriety in us. It should, it should produce something that we're like, wow, I need to think about why I do what I do. I need to make sure I'm spirit-directed. I have to make sure I'm doing it in love. I have to make sure that I'm doing it for the right motive and I don't want glory and all those things. Because again, our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful. Above all things, who can know it? And so we still retain that sinful nature and, and all that. So we can have this horrible thing be the case where we did the right thing, but in the wrong way or with the wrong heart. Doesn't it bring you joy if you have children or grandchildren when they get along, when they don't fight? We didn't allow our kids to fight. We'd stop it immediately. Boom. You're not allowed to mistreat each other. You're not, you know, we would stop it dead in its tracks. And it was hard because they want to tear each other's you know, organs out, basically. And you're trying, no, no, no. Don't, you are not allowed to say that to your sister. You are not allowed to treat her that way. But it blesses us when they show on their own, they show that they love each other. It blesses us. Well, how much more does it bless our Heavenly Father when we love each other? It matters to Him how we treat each other. So now notice in verse 31, as we begin our verses here, Jesus begins by speaking of His glorification. Verse 31, So when He had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. So it begins with, when he had gone out. Who is that? It's talking about Judas. He's purged Judas. Judas had gone out. And then the, the grammar there, when it talks about he had gone out, that verb there is in the active voice, which doesn't mean anything to you, but it means that, he, that, that Judas was initiating it. Judas was choosing to do it. It wasn't being done for him. Predestination wasn't driving him out of the room or anything like that. He already had it in his heart. He's already showed that he had it in his heart. He's already chosen to do this. And then because of that, he had fertile ground for Satan to enter him. And probably Satan entered him to make sure that it happened. Uh, and we don't know. But, but the point is, he did that. And he left. Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. He left on his own volition. And he says there, now the Son of Man is glorified. So Son of Man is a messianic title. So he's letting them, re he's focusing them on the fact that he is the promised Messiah, as Daniel talked about. And the, the religious leaders were always tweaked when he said the Son of Man, because they knew exactly what he was saying. So he says the Son of Man is glorified, and he's talking about going to the cross, the resurrection, and all of that. So the Father was glorified in Jesus, being obedient even to the point of death on the cross. It brought the Father glory. The Father's the one who sent him. And so it brings the Father glory, but at the same time, the, the Father is glorified in the Son, and the Son is glorified in the Father. So I want you to know in verse 32, look at the beginning of the, of the verse. It says, if God is glorified in him. In the original language, there's a certain construction that that's in that, that really should be translated since. So since God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself. So really what he's saying is, since the Father is glorified in Jesus, the Father will also glorify Jesus in himself, and he'll do this immediately. In a few uh, hours, Jesus is going to die, and he will be raised from the dead, and he will intermittently appear to the disciples over 40 days, weaning them off of himself, and then he's going to ascend to heaven. And he's going to be, the, the process of glorification will be complete. It'll happen immediately in that sense. So because Judas is going to, Judas left and is going to follow through with what he's decided in his heart to do, this whole chain of events is not going to stop. It's, it's, it's done. Like it's past the point of no return. So he's going to go do that and, and he's going to fulfill his betrayal plans and it will culminate in the cross very, very soon. Now I want to talk about just for a moment and bring you back to what we looked at back in chapter 12 regarding Jesus' instruction and re revelation of glorification and, and what's required to be glorified. And he compared the process of glorification in him um, to his disciples at this time because he was about to die. You may remember in John chapter 12, we studied it in verses 23 through 25, and I'll just read it again. It says, But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. 
He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So in this illustration, a a grain of wheat is, quote, glorified by producing much grain. The fruit that comes out of it being planted, that's, that's, he's, it's basically glorified in a sense. Where it's show, in other words, revealing its true purpose and what it was created to do. But the requirement is, Jesus said in that passage as I read, it has to die first. And that's why he connected the part about the disciples dying. Because he's saying, if you love your life, you will lose it. But he who hates his life in the world will keep it for eternal life. That's dying to self. And ultimately, all of them that are left in this room, except John, are going to be martyred for their faith, thus sealing the historicity and validity of the resurrection in their own blood. He wasn't abandoning them. He wasn't, well, you know, you followed me, and and now I'm just going to discard you and not care about what happens to you. No, no, no. This was the key to having those things established. Because in a court of law, you could present all the evidence of the disciples' testimony that they saw with their eyes that Jesus rose from the dead. They were cowardly, and then they became brave and gave their lives over testifying that Jesus rose from the dead. Because if he didn't rise from the dead, why would they give their lives? Because he had no no power to resurrect their lives. There's no power to to provide eternal life. But the fact that they saw him rose from the dead, it assured them that he could raise their bodies to life. Very powerful. There was a head professor in Harvard back in the 19th century that was Jewish, and his Christian students challenged him to look at the, at the testimony of those disciples and compare his or use his uh, textbook on what, how you administer the rules of justice to a case and challenged him to do that, and he looked at it, and as a result, he, he became a believer and thus wrote, wrote a book called Testimony of the Evangelists and identifying that. So it's very strong legal historical evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that you could present in a court of law that the disciples saw him raised from the dead because nobody is a coward and then gives their life. And they didn't get riches or fame or prosperity. They got mistreated and persecuted and killed if there was no real motive or, or way that they could receive eternal reward. So he's saying to them, you have to die first. You want to be glorified someday? You have to die first. Dying to self especially. And then they themselves would actually lay down their lives. So that's what Jesus is telling them. He's saying, I'm going to be glorified. As of right now, the process begins, but it only can begin because I'm going to die first, like that that grain of wheat. And and so that was meant to help them and meant to encourage them and meant to give them perspective. He's trying to fortify and inoculate their hearts against deception because they're going to be just pounded with despair and, and discouragement and depression. and Because again, they're looking for an earthly political Messiah. They're not looking for the Messiah that gets cut off according to Daniel chapter 9. They should have, but they weren't looking for that. They thought they were expecting this man, whoever he is, is going to rule on, the, on David's throne, on his ancestor David's throne, and they will, his rule will never end. But that, all those scriptures are talking about his second coming. They had no idea it was going to be coming twice. So he speaks of going away in verse 33. Look with me there. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, and he's going to tell them to love one another, but there, he's saying to them, you will seek me, and you, you will not be able to find me, just like he said to the Jews. And I can imagine their hearts are like, what? I understand if you're not going to, if the the unbelieving Jews can't go where you're going, but why can't we go where you're going? We're your followers. We're supposed to follow you wherever you go. How can you say we can't follow you anymore? Their whole lives were given over to following Jesus. Wherever he went, they went. Now he's telling them the following part's over in terms of my physical presence. Now you need to take care of one another. I can't be in your physical presence taking care of you. Now you need to take up where I left off in that sense and love one another. And I love how he calls them little children. It's the word technia in Greek, and it means a beloved child, and it insinuates immaturity. And it, it, it's not very common that you see it in the scriptures at all. And it's used only here in this context, but John's going to say it later seven times in his epistle. He's going to say little children. No doubt he got it from this whole experience, probably, or maybe Jesus always called them little children. 
But I love the fact that it's a beautiful picture of him being compassionate for them. He's showing his endearment, his love, like they were his kids, his spiritual kids. And he knows what's going to happen in their hearts when he's taken away, just like any other kid would be devastated if they're separated from their parents. And so much of that's happened in Israel with, with Hamas and family separated and children ripped apart from their parents, some of whom were killed and, and, and everything. And he knows what that does to a human heart. So he's going away. And so he says, I'm going to give you a new commandment, which brings us to my first of two points. The first one is Jesus calls us to love how he loves. Look at verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So he speaks of this new commandment. How new does this appear to you when you first read it? Does it appear new to you? It appears like it's old in a sense, on the surface. But the interesting thing is on the surface, it, 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 it looks a certain way, but as you dig deeper, it, it really they really see the difference there because here he's saying, he's saying two distinct things that are different than what we might think when we look at the surface. So I want to read to you something from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, which says this, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. They already knew this in the law. They're, it's very familiar to them. But the difference is, there's a couple different differences, but, but he's, he's now bringing this new commandment. It's not new in chrono, chronology. It's new in how the kind of love that he is talking about. He's not merely speaking about loving your neighbor. He's talking about loving other believers, other disciples. Because that, that verse in Leviticus talks about they don't have to be Jewish, you know, if they live next to somebody, no matter what they were and that their relationship was, they were to love their neighbor. What he's saying, you need to love other disciples. And also what he's saying, which is the key to all of this, is that he's speaking to them to love as he loved them. See, Leviticus chapter 19 never dealt with the intensity level of the love that they should love their neighbor with. But Jesus is adding that. He's adding Love, I'm talking to you as disciples to love each other, not just anybody. And the intensity should be that which corresponds with the love that you've already experienced from me. This is better than any definition that they could ever look up if they had dictionaries back then, because they know exactly how Jesus has been to them for these years. They know exactly how he's loved them. He's saying, you've experienced this new commandment in the sense of the intensity of the love I'm calling to, calling you to, because I've showed it to you. I've demonstrated it to you. You ever, you ever appreciate when you're trying to learn something, someone actually physically showing you and going step by step than actually just reading some ab abstract set of instructions? You know, I still am bitter against Ikea. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to put things together for my kids and they give me an Allen wrench that's this long, you know, and I'm like, eh, 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 trying to, you know, and then... They just put all these arrows, and I'm supposed to figure it out, and I, you just feel like an idiot sitting there, and like, this is not obvious. Why can't, this is like someone's job. This is, they, like, this, you had one job is to make it understandable for anybody to be able to put this thing together. Okay, I'm, I'm venting. This is like therapy. Sorry. I need to get over it. Uh, but, but the instructions are so important, some physical reference point to be able to understand what someone's talking about. So he's, he's going to say, look, this is a new commandment in the sense that who you're loving and the intensity of your loving, it's loving how I have loved you. And he's going to talk about, he's talked about it already, and John's highlighted it multiple times in the, this gospel already. He's defining what agape is, agape love. And, he, and what agape love is, it's doing what's best for someone else, even at our own expense. That's what agape love is. It's not a feeling. Sometimes people wait for a loving feeling, you know, before they do something loving. I have to, it's got to be feeling it. I got to have that vibe going where I just, all of a sudden I have this feeling like, but you know what that really is if you think about it? It's not love. It's affection. God never tells us that we have to have affection before we love. He just tells us to do it. And, and, and it's an act of obedience to him. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. 
You know what his commandments are? They're all about love. That's how we show love. Isn't it more important to us when someone's, instead of saying all the time they love us without showing it, if they actually show it? If we have to choose between the two, we're just going to say, just do the thing. Just, just show it. Just, just, just model it. Just show me. You can say anything with our mouths. Talk is cheap, they say, right? But, but showing it is a whole different thing. Do we recognize when people are doing what's best for us, even at their own expense? That's done all of the time in our lives, and we don't even pick it up. In the, in the church, there's people that prepare this sanctuary. They clean the church on Saturdays. You don't know who they are. There's people that prepare communion. There's people that, I can go on and on, do the audio, video. I mean, it, all these things that we don't even think about, they're doing it because it's best for us, because they love us. They want to do the right thing, and they want to serve the Lord because they love him. Again, the church can be summed up in love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is the church. We come here, we love God, we love God in our obedience during the rest of the time, and we love our neighbor as ourselves, but it's different. We are called to love each other as Jesus has loved us. Totally different standard. He's pouring a new definition into an existing classical Greek word, agape. They already had the word. Agape, it's not like agape didn't exist. It existed, but it didn't mean this. He is pouring a whole new meaning into it, and he's connecting that word with how he treated them. They're never going to forget that. Every time they talked about the word agape, they remembered what he did to them, for them, and all of that. And he's showing it now by giving all this instruction. So this kind of love, this agape love, doesn't need the other person to be lovable or to deserve it. Does God love us because we're lovable? He loves us because he is love. Again, the origins of his ability to love are not based in us. They're based in himself. So that's the kind of love that he's called us to. We're not love. You know, he's the defining definition of it. We're not. But the love that he has shown us, he gives us the capacity to do it where the catalyst for it doesn't have its origins in the person. It has its origins in what God provides us to love unconditionally. They don't have to worry to meet conditions in order to be shown this kind of love or be worthy of it. This kind of love doesn't need this catalyst, as I said. John would later write, God is love. So John will also write eventually in his epistle, first epistle, we love him because he first loved us. Our whole Christian life should be a response. We don't have a legal relationship with God alone. We do have a legal relationship because legally, we're designated a lot of things in Scripture that we would never think, of our, think about for ourselves. We'd never dream that it would be all the things he says about us. So we do have a legal relationship. We are entered into a new covenant. We're part of a new covenant. And, and so there's, there's, there's legal re requirements or legal circumstances that he has fulfilled, not us, that allows us to be sons and daughters and to be legally adopted. We've been legally adopted into the family of God. But God has commanded us to do this. And, and, and so... He's shown us this love himself. He doesn't ever ask us to do anything he hasn't already first done. Paul wrote in Romans 5.8, we love him, or he wrote that, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. There wasn't a, a catalyst in us. We, didn't, we weren't lovable then at all. And he still did it because he is love. So it's a high calling. It requires a lot to love this kind of way. You know, when we spend time with the Lord and we abide in him, he's going to get in, into that in a couple chapters. God produces the fruit of the Spirit through our lives. The, the most frustrating thing for me to see, and because I, I used to be in, in this when I was a new believer, is when people try to live the Christian life in the power of their own strength. It's so much easier than that. Just to abide in him, just to yield ourselves to him and draw close to him, and then just like any tree, produces fruit because of what it is and what it's tapped into in the root system, it produces fruit. There's no striving. We want to be obedient. We want to, we want to have fruit be produced through our lives. We just got to get close to Jesus. That's the solution to these disciples saying, I'm the greatest. Because he's saying, no, you're not the greatest. He's going to tell them in chapter 15 that apart from me, you can do nothing. And the only way they can do anything is to abide in Christ and let him produce fruit through their lives. But, but there will be pruning, there will be breaking, there will be 
you know, when you prune something, you hack it down, you look at it and go, man, that thing's going to die. It's not going to survive that. That's how we feel when we're getting pruned. But God's only doing that to make us more usable. He's only doing that to produce growth. It's an expression of his love to prune us. But yet we're, we're in that moment of being pruned. We're like, you don't love me. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this? Because he's using it to make us more like him. To be, we want the godly character. We don't always want what's required to get the godly character. There's a refining process. There's a pruning and breaking process. So we automatically start loving, and the fruit of the Spirit starts coming out of our lives as we spend time for him, with him, rather. I love being around Christians. I really do. I love. I love being around you. You know, I refer to you as the dear ones to other people outside the church. Did you know that? I do. If you're on social media, you see it because you're dear to me. And you are, even though we're not called to have to have someone lovable, I'm just telling you, you are lovely. You are very lovable uh, to me. And um, it's a beautiful thing when God does that work in us to, to recognize who he's put in our lives to, to love us back and for us to express that love. It's a labor of love. You've heard that phrase before, right? That everything going on in the church should be a labor of love at every single moment. Again, it's not a feeling. I don't have to work up to it. And I definitely don't have to love myself first. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God's called us to love ourselves. It doesn't say it. It's one of those things like cleanliness is next to godliness or God helps those who help themselves, not in Scripture. The, the problem is self-love. That's why in the end times, Paul wrote to Timothy his last letter and said, part of the characteristics of this wicked world is going to be men will be lovers of themselves. Now, we need to not condemn ourselves and hate ourselves and, because we are, we are God's creation. We have been made in his image. So I'm not saying that. But we don't have any prerequisites to be able to love anybody. And so that's, that's important for us to understand. And, and so I also want you to know uh, that if you look at the end of verse 34 where it says that you also love one another, that may seem redundant there, but there's a reason why he says that because it's in a tense that communicates continuous action. So really he's saying, a new commandment I give you that you should love one another as I have commanded you that you also continuously love one another. Continuously. It never ends. It never stops. Oh, I got my loving in, my loving quota in this month. I, I, I can't, I'm not supposed to do any more. No, it's Ev, all the time, constantly loving. When people love well, they anticipate needs. When people love well, they overlook things instead of nitpicking little things that people say or do, and they don't make what they are going to do, what's in their heart to do, based on anything that they do or don't do. You know, it takes a mature believer to overlook things. And, and God's called us to be great. That's, that's what being gracious is. That When he call, says it in the, in the Bible, Bearing with one another, that's what that means. Being patient with one another and putting up with stuff. Do you put up with stuff? Well, does it, does it, does what's coming out of you reflect what you want to come out of you? When, like they say, when you bump a cup, whatever's inside comes out for everyone to see. It's convicting. God wants us to be yielded to Him. And I'm, let me just tell you a little secret that I've learned over the years and definitely not original with me. Someone told me this. In the moment where you know you're supposed to be loving, a loving response, a loving action, whatever it is, and you don't sense that you have the power to, to do that or to say the appropriate thing, yield to God in your heart in that very moment. Yield to him and say, God, give me the power to do what's appropriate here, to be loving right now. Re fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. I have never had that fail. There are times where I'm talking to people and I know I need to be saying something loving in response to what they're saying to me, but I, it's not going on inside of me at all, you know, much worse sometimes. But I'll pray and ask the Lord for help, and he does it every single time. That's what abiding is. It's residing in him and letting him bear fruit through you. It's so much easier than what we sometimes are engaged in. We're trying to make something happen. It doesn't, doesn't work. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So, we need to spend time with him and have that love be overflowing. And it takes prayer. You cannot spend time with Jesus and not have the fruit of the Spirit cease, come, come out of your life. Like, it's going to happen. The closer that we get to him, the more. You always know when someone's been spending time with the Lord because they're just different. They're different. They have his character. Like, the collective picture of believers in our lives that are led by the Spirit and filled with the Spirit 
that that collective picture is really seeing how Jesus truly is because we really are his body. We really are his body, and he, and, and he uh, works through our lives, and, and we get to see Jesus. I love seeing Jesus in, in his people. It's beautiful. You can meet someone on the other side of the world. I've been in Siberia. My first, I wouldn't recommend your first mission trip to go to Siberia, but I did. Sandy and I both went. We weren't married yet, and man, it was very challenging. To, but, but the key is we saw believers. We met believers in the middle of fields out of nowhere, and they were just full of love and full of, and it's like you realize it's not, it's not a cultural thing. It's a spiritual thing. They're going to be, have that sweet aroma, that fragrance of Christ that's going to come forth from their, your, their lives, and it's a beautiful and very enjoyable thing. So it's important that we continuously love people and, and use every opportunity to do that. So now the second point and my final point this morning is love among Christians greatly impacts unbelievers. Look at verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So again, we shouldn't underestimate the power of our love towards one another. It's so powerful. We should flaunt it. We should flaunt our love before unbelievers. We sh- they, sh- they should go, you know what? I don't really understand what them and what they're about, what they believe and all these things. But one thing I do know, they sure love one another. And, and that is so powerful. It's, such, it's an evangelistic powerhouse to, for us to love one another. That's why when we have our greeting time, we're loving each other. It's so beautiful to the Lord. And it's so powerful if you're here and not a believer to see that kind of love because it's genuine. No one's forcing you to do anything. But that, that's just the beginning place. There's so many opportunities God gives us to show that love for one another. You know, I, I, I remember reading Cindy, our beloved sister Cindy's thank you card on the back table by how we brought meals to her when she had gone through her surgery and everything and how much it meant to her. We just forget sometimes how powerful the littlest things are and make such a, a difference because the Holy Spirit, when we're led by him, he will put an exponent above the little things that we do and make them so much more powerful than we think that they are. They're so powerful. How many, how many of you had someone thank you profusely for what you did for them and you thought it was really not that big of a deal? How many? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's very common. So why, why would we not want to love even more? That should be a motivation to show that love and demonstrate that love even more. So we need to show it. And He'll use, more, use it more than we can possibly imagine. Don't forget how rare love is in this world. It's getting really bad out there. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And so we can forget. We live our lives. We're, we're among God's people regularly, and we get to experience that love and see that love and all of that. But the world doesn't get to see that. They, they're, 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 it's really hard for them to, to see what genuine love is. And unfortunately, especially young people, it's so sad because they actually think that it's physical. That's the only real love is being physical, intimate with somebody, which is not the case at all in terms of the fullness of what love is and how we can experience it. So they, people, the world may not immediately admit that they are love starved, but they are. They're not going to say that, but they are. We know that they are. And so God knows that as well. And so, and I want you to see that he says this, by this, in verse 35, this, you all men will know that. What's this? It's, it's this one thing. He could have said that by this one thing, all men will know you're my disciples for how you love one another. It's a, it's a singular focus. I mean, he, not by how we debate about things they will know, not how we convict them of their sin or we're the sin police they will know, not acting like we're better than them, holier than thou, and we're going to be right at all costs. When I was a new believer, man, I'd get in arguments with unbelievers, and I would make sure that they knew that I was right no matter what. And I was showing all kinds of things other than love in the process of doing that. I'd walk away, and I would feel weird, and I would feel like the Holy Spirit was grieved, and it would dawn on me, there was zero love in that. You know, as it's been said, we can, we can win the argument but lose the soul. We have to get our eye on the big picture, what really matters. That's why it's so important that we ignore all the things that we could point out. 
God's not called us to be the Holy Spirit. We're going to see in, in a few chapters that he, the Holy Spirit's going to be given to convict the world of sin and judgment and righteousness and all the... He does a much better job. We make a lousy Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, when he really convicts, it's checkmate for them in their hearts. It was for us. So that's not what God's called us to do. They need to come away sensing our love. And, and sometimes we can let things go what they say because or what they're thinking the wrong things because we planted seeds and someone else is going to come and water them. It's not like this one person is never going to hear from another believer ever again. It's not all on us. So he's called us to be very, very specific and intense about our love before people. So we have to understand that as things get worse, and there's scripture that related to this, and I'll read in a second, but lawlessness and sin have a direct correlation with showing lack of love. Not only in the last days will people be lovers of themselves, which means that someone showing me love is going to be less and less because there's only one direction that our love is pointed, and that's inward, which is really sad. But it's going to be less and less. But when you have lawlessness going on, and that's abounding, even more uh, the love will, will wane. In the tribulation, we're told in Matthew 24, verse 12, and because lawlessness, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. We're already starting to see that more and more. People are So it just stands out so much. So when we're at Pete's, we're having coffee, and Dallas walks in. Hey, Dallas, how you doing? Great to see you. And I give him a hug, and people hear that we're, they overhear us talking about the Lord. Like, that is so beautiful to the Lord. So beautiful. We got more done in that than arguing and making sure we're right and refuting everything that they say and believe than anything else. So uh, the more that, that there's their sin abounding and lawlessness and all of that, the more that, wick, that love will stand out. Now the question might arise, it might beg the question, what if I'm not a loving person? Like I don't have a natural proclivity to loving. I'm just, I, you know, I remember telling this girl that was kept inviting me to church and she invited, she invited me, I got saved and everything, and then I said, okay, just relax. I'll, I'll come to church when I want to come. I don't really like people. And she goes, so what? God, God, will, God will show you. And then when I was called to be a pastor, I was like, God, again, I'm not into people. You know? And he reassured me he was going to change my heart, and he sure has. Sure has. It's only from him. Remember, the one who's writing this gospel was called one of the sons of thunder. At one point, John and his brother James wanted to call fire down from heaven and devour the Samaritans. And Jesus said, you know not of what spirit you are. That's the person that's called the the apostle of love. That's the one that talks about love so much in his first epistle and talks about it all through his gospel. Don't underestimate how God can change you. As you yield to him, he, d- he can do it. He can change our hearts and make us into something uh, entirely different. So as I close, I wanted to st- just to mention one little snippet of, of church history related to the Apostle John. So he, went, he was banished by the, the Roman emperor that was after Nero. I think it was two or three after Nero. He was banished to the island of Patmos where God gave him the revelation. But his life didn't end there. He was eventually released from there, and he pastored the church of Ephesus, as did Timothy earlier. And by this time, all the disciples are are gone. They're with the Lord. So he's there probably in his 90s. The average life expectancy at that time was about 45 years old. There was no midlife crisis because there was there was end of life crisis. Uh, when you're 45, you can't buy a Porsche. You know you're you're done. You know so he they were shocked that he was this old. But he, he would have to be carried in. So it was a regular routine. He would carry him in into the church in Ephesus, sit him down, and he would say, little children, love one another. And, and God's called us to love well. And he's given us all the tools and the resources to do it. We just have to yield ourselves to him and take advantage of those situations that he shows us. We are growing so much in loving one another in our church. It wasn't bad before, but it's getting better and better and better, and God's going to provide so many new ways in this coming year for us to show love, not towards just one another, but also to the world. But this is specifically talking about loving disciples. Let's love disciples well. Amen? Let's pray together.
Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that you have spared nothing in showing us your love. Lord, thank you for transforming us, giving us your Holy Spirit, who loves to love through us. Lord, we pray that you would help us to focus on people that are needy, help us to see the person sits alone, never talks to anybody, help us to see the person that is lonely even though they're in a room full of people. Lord, that's the person you have your eyes on. Help us to be sensitive to that. And Lord, help us to just recognize that we are called to be a family together and to be thankful for this family that you put together. You know where we don't strive. We, you know that we rely upon you. So we pray that you would use this body, Lord, to shine forth your love and have a massive harvest come to know you through this body. And we all agree in Jesus' name. Amen.